Hey math fans, I want to take a break from trig for a second here to review that infamous thing known as factoring. Going back to algebra, algebra 2, this becomes a bugaboo of a lot of students because when the problems get harder, a lot of teachers start teaching fancy formulas of ways to like figure out how to factor something. So what ends up happening is that students can't remember or understand those fancy ways that teachers are doing things and basically become afraid to factor. But it turns out that trial and error is really the way to go. That's the way I've always done it. And when I convince students that it's okay to try a particular factoring and then fail and try it again, um, they actually loosen up a little bit and it turns out to be no big deal to factor. So I'll just go through a bunch here. Now recall in factoring, the goal, first of all, you have to have a zero on the right or there's no point in factoring. So never, ever, ever factor anything that does not have a zero on the right like almost without exception. First thing we need to do is whatever's in the, at the beginning here, we need to have our first terms multiply to that. So since these are almost always going to be x squared problems, I mean they almost always are anyway, but in trig especially it's almost always going to be squared. So that means x times x would be x squared. Now the trick comes in what to put in the second part. We need two numbers that multiply to negative 3. Now, if you're not a big fan of factoring or you're at all afraid of it, I wouldn't even think about the middle term. I would just immediately think about, hey, what multiplies to negative 3? Well, it must be a plus something and a minus something, right? Because a positive times a negative is the only way to get a negative. So I'm going to do plus 1 and negative 3 because those are the first two numbers that cross my mind that would multiply to negative 3. But this might not be the correct factoring, so I just need to foil it out and see if it works. So to foil, we go x times x is x squared. Then our second term is this one, x times negative 3. It's going to be negative 3x. Then I need to add 1x and subtract 3. So this ends up being x squared, combine the two terms, minus 2x, minus 3. Is that correct, we ask ourselves. Uh-oh. It's actually pretty close. The only problem was that I have a minus sign where there should be a plus sign. It turns out that's no big deal. All I have to do is turn this into a negative 1 and this into a positive 3. Just switch the signs. I'll still have a negative times a positive. But now when you FOIL it out, you'll get x squared plus 3x minus x. So I just basically switch the, term, the signs on these guys. And that's going to save my bacon and make this a plus 2x instead of a minus 2x. Not the end of the world, right? So even, even though we had to go back and erase and try something again, that's no big deal. Way better than sitting there with sort of like a frozen pencil not sure how to factor something. Uh, let's remind you, this is a special case. There's no middle term. There's no x term. There's only x squared and then a number. But it does have 0 on the right, which is good. So we're still going to do this, but I just want you to remember the difference of squares formula, which is just you need a plus and a minus sign, and then the square root of this term is going to go both places. So this is going to be plus 2 and minus 2. And that'll work out because we'll get x squared minus 2x plus 2x, so the 2x is cancel, minus 4. Now, just a quick note, if we had had x squared minus 3, that doesn't look like the difference of squares. But in fact, it is. We can do the same thing. Because if we do draw two parentheses, x and x, plus and minus, and then what goes here is just the square root of this last term. So square root of 3 is just square root of 3, right? So this looks like a mess, but it might actually work out. We'll get x squared for our first term, then minus three, root 3x, or we'll write x root 3 so we don't get confused about whether x is under the square root or not, and then plus x root 3, and then minus root 3 times root 3 is 3. Well, check it out. Our middle term still canceled. So we get x squared minus 3. So this factoring worked. So that means that it doesn't even have to be the difference of squares. It just has to be the difference you know, a minus sign of two things you could take the square root of. Pretty excellent news. That means if this is x to the fourth, minus 3, that would have factored to x squared plus root 3 and x squared minus root 3. Pretty crazy. All right, here's another one. Once again, don't be afraid to start plugging in numbers. That negative 4x looks pretty intimidating, so see, we got x and we got x. We need a plus and a minus, and there's only two numbers that multiply to negative 5, 1 and 5. 
So we'll just try this. Let's see, we'll get x squared. So x times x is x squared. x times negative 5 is negative 5x plus x. Ooh, negative 4x. Yeah, it already worked out. And of course, the minus 5, so this is correct already. Now, just a reminder, when you want to solve this factoring problem, you would then set each one of these equal to 0. So it gives you two equations, x plus 1 equals 0, or x minus 5 equals 0. I, did, I hesitate to mention this because, you know, students usually don't have any trouble with this, but that means that x equals negative 1, or if we add 5 to both sides, x equals 5. So we get two answers. Anytime we factor something, we get two answers, which, of course, is once we're in trig equations, that's going to contribute to a lot of bow tie work. Hmm, interesting. Now this looks like a bummer. Because why? Anyone? Well, there's no number here. So a lot of times students get very tripped up by this type of situation. But actually that's because when you're factoring, you sort of forget the first rule of factoring, which is factor out any like terms. So there's actually an x in both of these, right? They're really doing us a favor by not having a plus number here. That means that everything cont contains an x. This contains 1x, and this is basically x times x, so we can factor out an x. So we get x times x plus 2 is what's left over, equals 0. So now we've actually, we're good to go here. Just like on the previous problem, we set each of our two parentheses equal to 0. This, print, this doesn't really have a parenthesis, but that's because it's sort of x plus 0 is one way of looking at a plain old x. So we just get x equals 0. And then we set x plus 2 equals to 0 we get x equals negative 2. So once again, we get two answers, and this is actually easier. Even though it looks harder and it can be confusing, it's actually easier. And this one actually shows up, this factoring pattern shows up a lot in trig equations, because that'll give you like a cosine or sine equals 0, which is a good trick. All right, x squared plus 4. Hmm, tricky. x squared equals negative 4. Oh, cannot take the square root, right? Because you can't take the square root of a negative number. So this, this would have given imaginary answers, but since we're not in Algebra 2 anymore, we're just going to call no solution. Same thing would happen if you tried to factor this. I just, um, you can only factor the difference of squares. If there's a minus sign between the two things, you can factor it as a difference of squares. But a sum of squares, you cannot factor. And that's because of this reason. You'd end up taking the square root of a negative. All right, so... Now I'm starting to get a little trickier. I put a number in front of the x squared term. Not to fear, though. All we have to do is split this into two things that would multiply to 4x squared. So instead of x and x, it could either be x and 4x, or it could be 2x and 2x. I always go with 2x and 2x first if I'm in a situation like this, uh, just because it seems like that's us you know, usually they're nice enough your teacher is nice enough to not make it one of the more difficult ones that you're less likely to try. So we just put the 2x and 2x there, and then be, now I just need to worry about multiplying to negative 1. The only way to do that is to multiply a negative 1 and plus 1. And it doesn't matter which one you put where. You know, plus 1 and minus 1, you could switch places, it doesn't matter. So now let's foil this out and see if we were right. We get 4x squared plus 2x minus 2x. Uh-oh, my x is all canceled. Bummer. So that must not have been right. Um, you know what? It probably wasn't, these probably shouldn't have been 2x and x. They probably should have been 4x and x. Because there is no way to get, you know, I didn't have any options between besides minus 1 and plus 1. There's no other way to get minus 1. So that means my x's must have been wrong. So now we got 4x minus 1 and x plus 1. So we got 4x squared, 4x plus times 1 is 4x, minus x is 3x. Oh, so now I've got 4x squared plus 3x minus 1. So close, all I've got done wrong now is I have the wrong sign right here. So I think if I switch this up and I put 4x plus 1 instead, and then x minus 1, that should give me 4x squared minus 4x plus x minus 1, so yeah, the, four, the negative 4x and positive x become negative 3x. Problem solved. And here's our last one. Oh man, these are, these are brutes. So you can see I have numbers here 
and I have some things that have multiple factorings over here. So let's see how it goes. As usual, I'm going to try 2x and 2x. Oops. 2x. And then i got to do a plus 2 and a minus 3. I'll try that. It could have been minus 2 and plus 3. We'll see what happens. 4x squared minus 6x plus 4x. Oh, yeah, it works out. And then, of course, minus 6 equals 0. So there we go. If I wanted to solve this, I would set 2x plus 2 equals 0, and 2x minus 3 equals 0, and then solve each of those for x's, and those would be my two answers. Save that one for last. That looks horrible. All right, here's a tricky one. Now, what's different about this? I did not make it equal 0. So the first thing I need to do is take away 4 from both sides to get the equation into a factorable form. Plus 15x, and then minus 4 equals 0. So I'll try my usual 2x and 2x, and then 4, I, I figure, is probably plus 2 and minus 2. So let's see how that works. Uh-oh. Well, I just noticed this is a difference of squares factoring. So because I have a plus 2 and a minus 2, and then 2x and 2x, everything's going to cancel here. I'll get 4x squared minus 4, and all the x terms cancel. So that must not be the right answer. Um, you could do plus 4 minus 1. So you notice I have a 15x here. It's going to be pretty tough to get 15x without multiplying some big numbers together. So on this one, I would get a middle term of positive 8x minus 2x is positive 6x. Wow, that's still not big enough. You know, I'm just getting a middle term of 6x. I think I'm barking up the wrong tree. I think maybe I should have done 4x and x. Because by putting the 4x here and the x here, now I've got a 4x that I can multiply by a big number to get where I need to go. So if I set it up so that the, that the 4x is going to get multiplied by 4, you know, so if, if I'm going to... If I'm going to put in a 1 and 4, I could either put the 4 over here where it ends up getting multiplied by the 4x to make a really big middle term. Or if I wanted to play that down, I could put the 4 here where it just gets multiplied by a single x. But since I was, since 15x is so big, I'm going to try and make a really big number. So let's see how this works. This ends up with 4x squared plus 16x. Wow, see how that really vaulted up my middle term? Minus x. Yeah, it worked. And then minus 4 equals 0. So this is, in fact, the correct factoring. Took me a few tries, but that's not the end of the world. Just keep trying, and once you keep doing trial error again and again, you'll start getting better at noticing the patterns. Like, when you see a 15x middle term, you develop a sense of, like, oh, man, that's really big. I'm going to have to figure out a way to get, you know, big numbers multiplied by each other to get that big a term. Oh, man, that last one was so hard. I don't even want to attempt this, but let's go for it. At least I, 3x squared can only be had by 3x and x. So that saves me a little bit of trouble. And then I could do a plus and minus. So the question is, what numbers to put for plus and minus? Um, hmm. I'm going to go 4 and 3. What the heck? So 3x squared minus 9x plus 4x. Yeah, I got lucky on the first try. So this foils out to 3x squared minus 9x plus 4x minus 12. So these obviously combine into minus 5x. Yay, so now if I want to solve this, I just take each of these parentheses and set them equal to zero. Pretty nice. All right, so hopefully that reminds you how to factor. And if you've always hated factoring, hopefully it makes it seem a little friendlier. The problems I did here were very difficult. These were like the doozies where you have to try a bunch of different times before you find out exactly what combination of numbers will get you what you want. But the point is, just a matter of time. There's only so many possibilities for each problem. So the worst case scenario, you have to go through all six or eight or whatever it is, but usually you're going to get lucky and find it on the second or third. And once you practice more, you'll start moving up your batting average to where you're finding it, you know, start noticing the patterns, and you'll, maybe you'll be able to find it on your first or second try. And of course, if you become a true factory master, you could do it on your first try every time. But hey, I haven't even gotten there yet, so maybe you'll beat me to that level.